Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Videodrome. This film came out in 1983. It was written and directed by David Cronenberg. Cronenberg, of course, is an icon, a Canadian filmmaker who is known for the body horror genre, the sci-fi horror genre, making many reputable classics, particularly in the 1980s and the 90s. Films like The Fly, Scanners, Naked Lunch. He's a director that I greatly admire and I've appreciated as he's evolved over time because I, I really think he's fantastic in terms of his versatility as a film filmmaker and as a writer, and more so than you might perceive at first glance. Videodrome came after the success of Scanners, and it's one of those horror films that bombed when it came out originally, uh, but since then it has become a cult classic, and many considering it to be one of the great body horror films ever made. And I'd have to agree, this is actually one of my favorite horror movies ever, which is saying something because I do have an affinity for the genre, if you haven't noticed. I just think it's so well composed, it's so well written, it's so well structured, and it's challenging, it's unexpected, it explores concepts about television and film and how it affects our consciousness, how it is perceived and translated through the mind, what it evokes within us emotionally. And these are the sorts of questions that are difficult to pose, difficult to answer, um, but I wish that more filmmakers were willing to go there and really uh, delve into those ideas, lift the curtain, as it were, on entertainment as a tool and as a reflection of who we are. This is a film you definitely want to argue about. I've heard all kinds of different interpretations, what people think this means or that means, and yeah, you know, despite all of that, I feel like it is so wonderfully uh, focused and so beautifully pieced together so that it's both cohesive and ambiguous, and that is such a difficult thing to pull off. Even the opening scene to me is setting up a very layered and very complex point of view on the subject. You have uh, the wake-up call video that is waking up our, our protagonist, Max Rin, played by James Woods. The girl on the tape is already saying it's time to ease back into consciousness, so already the seeds are being planted. The idea of consciousness and awakening from the dream state. And that's important to note because often throughout the movie the lines are very blurred, between what is real and what is not, what is perceived by the mind and what is not. And this point is meant to reflect how blurred the lines are just in general. That our entertainment, and just particularly if you just want to be more basic, just our stories, our narratives tend to come from dreams, from our dream state. The, uh, the desires and the fears that are lurking within our subconscious that we wouldn't dare say out loud. Though we can depict it through art, and in the case of some, you can exploit it for, for personal gain. And the film seems to take all of these different characters there aren't, at least not a huge ensemble, but it does take each particular character and, and it's using them as a sort of archetype, as a symbol for how different facets of the medium of televised entertainment affects them and what it represents within us all. And yes, people talk constantly about how film and just entertainment in general, how it influences us. You know, we've heard for years and years and years how, you know, mass shootings are there's the discussion about it being um, influenced greatly by entertainment, by violence in entertainment. But this film is much more complex than that in terms of how it's presenting its thesis. It's saying that Yes, television and entertainment is a major influence on us, and many do take it too lightly, but at the same time, you know, there's more to it. It is a continuous cycle. It feels, entertainment feels deeply connected to the unconscious mind as though almost like it was attached by like an umbilical cord. We project ourselves onto the entertainment that we're consuming because it's so close to our dreams, it's so close to our intimate feelings and our thoughts. So that's why entertainment often affects us so deeply, and it can be in ways that we don't even realize. And often even filmmakers, when, when they make movies, they're often projecting their own ideas and their own desires, and you know, there's a lot of Freudian metaphors and such that they don't even catch. It can be through color, it can be through, through camera shots, it can be through stimulation of all sorts. I actually really love that there's a major sexual component to the film, and I love the way that it's explored because it becomes the catalyst for how our main character, Max, is going to evolve. He becomes friends with a radio host named Nikki, they end up having sexual relations, and one night he shows her Videodrome, which is basically a, like a plotless television show that he wants for his network, and it, it basically just shows people getting tortured gratuitously. I feel like if we had this scene in most films, the 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 female character would be the one turning it off being like oh i don't i don't want to watch this how dare you but i love the fact that this girl no she's she's into it she's turned on by it she represents a key area of the female brain that is often neglected 
in stories and, it, and it's honestly considered taboo to this day. But I think it's essential to being able to understand the core idea behind desire. Vicky is into sadomasochism and she wants Max to hurt her sexually. Uh, and that's something that, I mean, you could say is inspired by video drum, video drum to an extent, but clearly, and, and they make this very clear, it's something that she's already been doing and probably for a long time. Yes, I think women, even though they do want that power for sure, there's all, they're always fighting that natural instinct, you know, the primal instinct for masculine domination. And often I think that can stem from complex motivations, you know, whether it is internalized misogyny or just purely wanting to be in touch with that animalistic nature or that emotional connection. So I, I just found the character of Nikki and, and that whole plot very refreshing. She's completely unafraid and ready for it, whereas he is the one who's struggling naturally because, you know, that is something that is you can have repercussions from that. And of course, civility that we've created as humans has helped us repress a lot of those those violent impulses and desires. But you start to see as the film goes on that that primal masculine desire, desire is starting to come through in him. There is a very thin line in the world that separates what is primal and what is civil, which is why humanity seems to always be right on the edge of utter chaos. And the dreams and the entertainment spawned from all of this, they all sort of run together and, and they blend into one another, almost like it's just one nucleus. And he even says to her when they first meet, you know, she makes a point about how overstimulation and the influence of gratuitous sex and violence is bad in the media. And he says, well, why are you wearing that dress? It's, it is very stimulating. It's sexy and it's red and, you know, the Freudian thing, as he mentions. And she goes, yeah, you know, she admits to being affected by this over stimulation herself. And yeah, I just, that's another scene that to me that is very refreshing um, with content that I think we need more of. Yes, women can complain about gratuitous sex and whatnot, rightfully so for sure in certain instances, but at the same time, they also choose to stimulate others through how they dress and, and through how they look with their hair and their makeup, their perfume, because it gives them a, the ability to, to sexually arouse and, and, and to give in to that primal need while also exercising a sense of control and confidence and just how they present themselves. And all of that ties into television in many ways because television is a way to project our desires onto something without having to truly exercise them. Watching a television screen or watching a movie in a theater or whatever is is very much a voyeuristic experience. And it's so hard to figure out where the line should be drawn because again, they all feed into each other. It's all part of the cerebrum. But how it's tilted often into more violent and negative directions can have a serious effect on us emotionally. And when you lose that balance between what is civil and what is primal, then that's where the real dilemma occurs and that's what's happening within the main character. That is our conflict. I think a huge part of why it's getting to him and why the lines are starting to blur between reality and fantasy in a metaphorical sense is because entertainment to us often feels much more real than reality because it is spawned from what is so internal. So why do we, our dreams often feel more real than reality? Because it's often psychologically more revealing than the way we present ourselves and the way we conduct ourselves in real life. It is an extension of us and television is an extension of that too. And the internet even more so. When you read comments on the internet, it's often so different likely than how these people would be conducting themselves in real Real life because you know the internet it's it's a slippery sort of thing it's not quite concrete it doesn't feel real it feels more like a dream and it, in a way it, it is a lot like a dream because it's where your subconscious is is venting and getting out all this information with little consequence and it's often motivated motivated by toxic things like sadness and insecurity and loneliness even with myself my my persona online would be deep focus lens and you know it's a persona that's very complex to me and i couldn't help but think about that as I'm watching the movie, because even though in a lot of ways, yeah, it's not real, it's not who I really am, it's not my, my name or anything like that, and I don't necessarily conduct myself in real life like I do on here, because it's, it's prepared. But in other ways, Deep Focus Lens often feels more real than who I am in real life, uh, because the content of what I'm saying here is truer and more close to who I am, what I believe, and what I'm interested in. Uh, so, and also, I'm, I'm in control of the content that I'm putting out. So it's really the same thing. As Brian Oblivion says in the film, and I think it's the key line in the whole thing, is that uh, television is reality 
and reality is less than television. The film is so hyper aware of its medium and the influence of that medium to such a major degree, and yet it still in many ways is, is ahead of its time. What happens next is we probably merge with technology. We merge with our smartphones and our online personas. And even though this movie was way before all that and, and way before the internet existed, uh, it does have a lot of that in the imagery, uh, man merging with technology, man merging with weaponry. We see it when Max merges with his gun or it looks like it's like growing out of his hand. I love all of the, the special effects that they do here, the makeup throughout the film, especially the hand merging with the gun and uh, the death of Barry later is so cool. All masterfully grotesque and done of course by the the, the legendary Rick Baker, one of the great uh, makeup artists of his time. And to me nothing beats those those 1980s special effects because they are handmade, they have that human touch, so it makes it kind of comforting in a weird way. It's not realistic. There's more of a style and an art to it. And as the film is progressing, Max, of course, is getting more and more influenced, affected by Videodrome, to the point where he can't tell the difference between what is real and what is not. So it's slowly becoming a sort of psychedelic odyssey in a way. And they implement that very cleverly in very small ways. They're planting those seeds as well. There's a scene where Nikki, uh, she, she puts a cigarette out on her on her chest and he's like, no, no, don't do that. And then in the next scene, he is suddenly triggered by when Masha lights the cigarette. So the film is constantly bridging the internal and the external very brilliantly and tying the multiple women together in the movie. And it gets very, very Freudian. And the movie gets more psychedelic as it goes on, very creative and interesting because it's like visually, it's very warped and there's something sexual about the imagery going on. It's also quite nightmarish and, uh, abstract. And the psychedelic parts of it to me are also quite symbolic because, I mean, just in my own interpretation, because psychedelics and particularly LSD, which is kind of what the imagery is reminiscent of here, it taps into exposing the illusion. When you take LSD, it's exposing the illusion that is in front of you, the illusion of perception and what is seen and taken in by the eye. And like I've said a million times, both on camera and off camera, you know, exposing the illusion and allowing the lines between what is real and not real to blur is hopefully when you can start to accept everything and accept death for potential rebirth. And this is why Brian Oblivion to me provides like, you know, the most woke uh, point of view on the philosophy. He is the most aware, the most at ease with his fate. And you can look at it as maybe a very dangerous point of view, but at the same time you have to be like, wait, you know, he does have a point there. He isn't afraid to die because he sees the existential meaning through the whole concept. And he understands that the body is temporary. It is a host. Perhaps all of this is an illusion. And yes, death is inevitable and imperative so that rebirth into the illusion is possible again. Yes, also, Videodrome is a tool for corporate and financial gain. And we see that method of control through different characters of the film. And I love the way the, the plot is constantly shifting and keeping you guessing when it comes to that. Seeing it change from person to person is what makes the movie feel uh, so interesting as it's progressing. But ultimately to me, the, the thing that sticks with me is how it is revealing about the mind. And you end up feeling all kinds of mixed emotions and feelings about the film. And there are no clear answers. For me, the, the final image of the film and the final scene is one of the best in any horror film. I know a a lot of people see it as Max maybe losing his identity completely to the Videodrome. You know, he, he sees an image of himself on a screen where he kills himself and then he mimics that. As though he's giving in to this, this primal toxic desire and he can no longer think for himself. He is like a zombie to the, to the entertainment. And, and though, yes, I think an aspect of that is absolutely true for me, uh, I think that there's more to it, at least in terms of what I took away from it. In some ways he is gaining the upper hand over the antagonists and the oppressive forces in the movie. In other ways, he's he's not at all. And the in screen where he's mimicking what he sees on screen, to me, may be more a mirror of reality. And, and perhaps there's no difference between the two. The illusion, again, feeding into reality or vice versa. As a device, you know, he's confronting the antagonistic forces so he can go on to that final test. And this is where he has to be able to let go of the body as a host. And in a way, you could almost 
look at that as maybe a transcendent thing. Accepting this illusion and, and accepting the new stage of this evolution and, you know, in some ways leading towards that rebirth. It's a liberating thing to me, but also a, a very dark thing. And seeing how much our desires are projected onto our entertainment and technology can overpower and, and guide the parts of us that are rational. But what an ending. It really, really is a great one. And I can't say enough good things about it, for sure. There is a special charm to it because it is certainly a product of its of its time, as particularly aesthetically, but the material itself is handled with such care and such intelligence, and that is very rare. It has a satirical quality to it in the midst of that social commentary, and I think there are many great Cronenberg films, but this one might be one of my very favorites. I just can't get over how condensed the film is. It feels so succinct and it's covering so many different bases. It's only an hour and a half and it doesn't feel like it needs to be any longer. It doesn't feel like it needs to be any shorter. It's pretty perfect. And yet what you feel in such a short amount of time is, is those emotions are constantly fluctuating, yet they remain connected to the core. This movie has a lot of very strong connective tissue. To me, the idea of tackling so many concepts all at once, especially when it's about the medium that you're using to make said points, to me, is very ambitious. The perceptions of reality can be a really tough thing to analyze, and it should be, because nobody really understands it. Nobody really understands what's what's going on in the mind fully. But this one fleshes it out beautifully and effectively through different characters, through different archetypes. It is dark, it is evocative, and I think it's a, it's a must for cinephiles, it's a must for fans of David Cronenberg, and just for curious people who, who like movies. And that is my review. Thank you all for listening. All my social media information is below. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you want to. Catch you next time.